from coast to coast, live via satellite, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and around the world, covering over 500 million souls with the good news of new life in Jesus Christ. And now from the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, we invite you to be a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. on Praise the Lord is Senior Minister of the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Dr. and Mrs. James Kennedy, and the pastor of the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California, Dr. E. V. Hill. And ministering tonight in music is Dean and Mary Brown, Dino and Cheryl Kakadakis, Laverne and Edith Tripp, and Chris Holloway. And ready to take your phone calls, some of the most beautiful prayer partners in the world. And now your host, the founder and president of TBN, Paul and Jan Cross. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to one of America's great and historic churches, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. What a joy to be here tonight and to find out that you all shout a lot more than I thought you did around here. This is wonderful. It's good to be here. We have been made to feel so wonderfully welcome and uh, we just couldn't be happier how many by the way do call coral ridge home church give me a big love wave out there thank you thank you thank you for opening the doors of this beautiful church to all of our great tbn family and making us feel so very much at home let me read a little psalm and then jan is going to give you a word of greeting and then we'll have a special welcome from our host pastor dr james kennedy and his good wife ann Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing it everywhere around the world. Sing out His praises. Bless His name. Each day tell someone that He saves. Publish this glorious act throughout the earth. Tell everyone about the amazing things our God does. For the Lord is great beyond description and greatly to be praised. Worship only him among the gods, for the gods of the other nations are merely idols, but our God made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty are in his temple. O nations of the world, confess that God alone is glorious and strong. Give him the glory he deserves. Bring your offerings and come to worship him. Worship the Lord with the beauty of holy lives. Let the earth tremble before him. Let the nations tell the nations that Jehovah reigns. He rules the world. His power can never be overthrown. He will judge all nations fairly. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the vastness of the roaring seas demonstrate his glory. Praise him for the growing fields, for they display his greatness. Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise, for the Lord is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the nations fairly and with his truth. Let's say thank you to the Lord for his word tonight. And may he add his blessings to all of us through it, we pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As I said a moment ago, I think I have the prettiest little grandma in the whole world with me here tonight. Hello, Jan. Say hello to these good folks. At Coral Ridge. Such a joy. Such a joy to be here. We have loved Dr. James Kennedy for so many years, and it is such an honor to be invited to this church. It's just wonderful. Dr. Kennedy, you have to understand, I'm a little Pentecostal preacher's girl from Columbus, Georgia, and this is quite an honor, and I thank you for this. I, I am really, really honored. You know, I guess the thing that was on my heart today is 
I receive so many letters from so many people that when I say to people on the air, I love you and Jesus loves you, so many times it's the only time that they hear those words. And that's almost unbelievable to me, but the letters say it's true. And tonight I thought, if nothing else, the one thing that I could say to you is that I do love you. But let's see if there isn't somebody, maybe right here in this building, maybe there in your home, that hasn't heard those words today or maybe yesterday, or the day before, or like one little lady said to me in a letter, I hadn't heard those words for 10 years until I heard you say it over the air, I love you. So if you'd just do one thing before we start tonight, if you would turn to the person on your left, and turn to the person on your right right here, and just say to them, I love you, and Jesus loves you. And those of you in your home, turn to somebody there and tell them, I love you, and Jesus loves you. And that is a wonderful word of encouragement tonight. And remember that we do love you, and Jesus does love you, and it's a joy to be here tonight. Oh, praise God. Remain standing for just a moment. And uh, I'd like for our host pastor, Dr. Kennedy, and his good wife, Ann, to come and join us. Let's tell them thank you on behalf of all of the TBN family for making us feel so very welcome here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And Dr. Kennedy, I have to say, I, I do not really feel strange in this church at all. Jan and I join you quite often in your worship services. You come Sunday afternoons at in our homes in California, and, and so we kind of feel like we're home tonight. Give us a word of greeting. Well, thank you very much, Paul. We're delighted to have uh, you and Jan, and uh, praise the Lord, and the Trinity Broadcasting Network here in our church today. I told Jan a few minutes ago that I wanted her to feel perfectly at home, and we had prepared a special robe for her to wear. Uh, we, uh, they're sewing the sequins on it right now. <laughs> A moment ago, Paul, you announced to the uh, congregation here that uh, this program is going to be semi-live tonight. I hope that was not because it's in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> Well, it has been my pleasure to know Jan and Paul for the last decade or more, and uh, we're happy to have the Coral Ridge Hour that airs uh, every week on uh, their network, as well as two other programs which uh, emanate from this church, The Joy of Music with our organist Diane Bish, and also Gloria with Art Linkletter. And I praise God for what you and Trinity have done in taking the gospel all across this nation and now all across this world. And I would like to have you meet, uh, not a grandmother, but uh, the loveliest mother I know. I'd like to have you say hello to my wife, Anne. Thank you. I welcome you all here, too. We're so glad to have you, and I hope you'll have an excuse to come back to see us again. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Pastor Hill, he'll be preaching second tonight, so we thought we'd have him come and say hello to you and maybe tell us where to get our Bibles open and lead us in prayer. Well, it's just a joy to be back in Fort Lauderdale. And it's a joy to be back here at Coral Ridge. It's been some years, but I've been here. And it's a joy indeed to be here with Dr. Kennedy. I call him the Apostle Paul of our times. He's a great...
He's a great preacher prophet of our days. And if you get him stirred up, brother, you got something on your hands. He, he'll dig every text in the book out and throw them on you. And he may not shout, but when he gets through preaching, I'm shouting. <laughs> What a joy it is to be in Florida. Florida is one of the great states. Just about every other letter I get is from Florida, including those who ask for rent. It's from Florida. But I'm glad to be here. And I love Florida. I love you people. Thank God for Paul and thank God for Jan and Trinity. We're just one family. Now let us pray. Our Father and our God, we lift uh, this entire experience up to you. Thank you for this place. Thank you for being invited here. Thank you for the people who have caused us to come, the pastor and people who have opened the doors. Thank you for Paul and Jan and Trinity as we've now come together as one family. And we have come to fellowship to enjoy you and to enjoy you in the spirit and to point you as the only savior to men who are lost. And we pray right here tonight that your Holy Spirit will bless us anew and cause men and women, boys and girls, to say yes to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, and we expect with great anticipation what you're going to do tonight. Bless every tongue, bless everyone who tickled the ribs of the instrument, bless everyone who's here. Let us let go and let God abide in this place tonight, for we ask it in Jesus' name, and all of the people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hill. You may be seated. Among other things tonight, we are praying that our coming together from many different denominations and traditions across America will make a powerful statement to the world and to the body of Christ that we really are one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. And as I said a little earlier, may these old walls of denominational and traditional division crumble just like the Berlin Wall did a few weeks ago. And may the world finally truly see that we are his disciples because we do have love one for another in Jesus' name. And then, of course, most of all, let us be in agreement and in prayer together tonight that some soul outside the ark of safety will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through our efforts tonight. Those of you watching across America by television, prayer partners are on the line. There's a number on your screen. It's never an interruption for you to phone that number. We want to hear from you. We'll receive your prayer requests and your reports of salvation so that we may rejoice together. Praise God. Dean and Mary Brown are here tonight to make this great church ring with the praises of God. Joyful, joyful. Sing with them. Joyful, joyful.
24th Psalm says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Would you worship with us this evening? Worship his majesty. bless us with their great songs that magnify the name of the Lord. You know, one of the great things about having a, a great network, every time we sign a new station on, we get acquainted with that area, and lo and behold, there's usually a great talent, in some cases many fine new talents that we discover and are able to incorporate into the programming of Trinity Broadcasting Network. Uh, by the way, let me just tell you quickly, parenthetically, in case you hadn't heard, the FCC approved Atlanta, Georgia. Big, full-power broadcast station. We've already gone to work, and we're laying the foundation, and before this year is over, God willing, and the creek don't rise, as we say down in Missouri, uh, we will have this big full power station on the air, one of the great metropolitan areas of the United States that we have not really had a television presence in until now. So pray for us as we build yet another big full power station. A couple of years ago, a big full power, one of our educational stations, signed on the air down in Houston, Texas. Hello, Houston. They're watching on Channel 14 down there tonight. And one of the young men that dropped by and we got acquainted with is Chris Holloway. He is here with us tonight. He is a professional opera singer. 
sings with the Houston Grand Opera, has sung with Placido Domingo, the most famous opera star in Spain and Europe, and he brings his beautiful talent here to Coral Ridge tonight. I think you'll think, as I do, that he fits in real well in this great cathedral tonight. Let's tell Chris Holloway welcome tonight from Houston, Texas, a grand old hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Thank you, Chris. Chris Holloway. Just a lot of our TV and family is here with us tonight, and I'm sure many of you have been blessed these past several months since he's done, what, two or three series now, honey? Dino Kartsanakis. How many are watching the Dino program once in a while? 
on Trinity Broadcasting. His beautiful wife, Cheryl, is with him here tonight, and she has brought a beautiful new touch and dimension, mercy, dancing on Christian television. Can you believe it? But I'll tell you, we're beginning to realize that Satan robbed us of the dance, and we should have kept it all along. In fact, Dr. Kennedy, I understand you at one time were quite famous for your dance. Uh, yes. Um, I believe in his younger, wilder days, he was, what, an Arthur Murray instructor. So, do you all dance here? And you should, you know, I mean. <laughs> oh, dear. But we're realizing that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. And there's a lot of stuff that we let Satan steal from us, but we're taking it back in Jesus' name, including the airwaves. Many of you will remember Dino as uh, he traveled some years ago with the late Catherine Kuhlman. And I can always remember how Catherine introduced him. Jan would have to do this as she would flit her in. She sort of danced in. You remember when she came in to make her entrance and she would say, and now here's Dino. And Dino would come in and, of course, bless us and thrill us with his tremendous talent at the piano. He is now doing a regular television program for your TBN. Um, it's seen Wednesdays at 5.30. It'd be 8.30 here in the South Florida area. Um, he's been recognized as one of the world's greatest sacred uh, pi pianists. He is the six-time winner of Gospel Music's Dove Award and has over 20 albums to his credit. Let's welcome Dino and Cheryl Kartsanakis as they come. Give us a little word of greeting, Ch Dino. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see you. <laughs> Dr. and Mrs. Kennedy, it's a pleasure to be here once again. Coral Ridge, I've played here two or three times and uh, always have had a wonderful, wonderful evening here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. This. Uh, church is known to have some incredible musicians come here as their concert series and a lot of classical music has been played right from this platform some of the greatest composers have been performed here and i thought it'd be kind of nice to play maybe a medley of classical music right now i i think it'd be appropriate don't you would you like to hear that okay this is a classical medley
Thank you so much. I am feeling so good tonight. You people are wonderful. And you know, the joy of the Lord is in this place here this evening. Yes. Amen. You know, I really feel through classical music we can praise the Lord. The talent came from the Lord, you know, when, it, when all this music was written. I am not a composer, and sometimes I ask the Lord, why, Lord, didn't you help me write some, some wonderful music throughout my musical career? But I guess I'm supposed to be just a pianist and communicate songs that other people write. But just recently, I got inspired to write a melody. A melody that inspired me when Cheryl and I went to communist China with Nora Lamb. And I watched that lady's ministry. It has really blessed me. And now I understand a major movie will be coming out. I am so excited. I can't wait to see. I understand it's, it's completed as far as the filming, and now they're in the editing room. But here's a theme that I wrote, and I title it, Norris theme. Tell me if you like it. If you don't, don't tell me. <laughs> Norris theme.
My wife, Cheryl. Come on up here, honey. Give her a big hand, would you please, my wife? I, I want Cheryl just to share with you a little bit. If you watch our television show, The Dino Show, uh, Cheryl's on it, and I get so much mail. I'm telling you, it's incredible. The people that keep saying, if, if Cheryl's not on enough, they'll say, why wasn't Cheryl on? And uh, people love her everywhere, and I, I appreciate her support and her love for me and this ministry. And I thought it'd be kind of nice. Wouldn't you like to hear her say a few words? I think it'd be kind of nice for her to do that tonight. Go ahead, honey. Thank you so much. It's, it's such a, a beautiful evening already. There's been... There have been so many different types of uh, worship shared here already, Dino, and, and uh, uh, you played a few pieces that were totally, pretty much unrelated. But you know, everything that's done here tonight is related through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ because we know the reason. And it uh, reminds me of a little story my, my father used to tell in his ministry. And uh, it seems somehow totally unrelated but you'll figure it out at the end. There was a young man named Jim, uh, kind of a disheveled, tattered young man, uh, went to school in, one room, in a one-room schoolhouse, and each day he wore the same old faded jacket, and the kids kind of made fun of him, you know, like kids can do without really meaning to. And uh, one day, someone's lunch was missing. And, of course, the teacher immediately said, Jim, did you take the lunch? And he said, well, yes, teacher, I ate the lunch, but you see, I was so very hungry. And she said, well, that's no excuse, and you have to be punished. And then she turned to the class, and she said, um, you, you say what you decide the punishment should be. Tell me. And they called out various types of punishment. And then she listened to them, and she turned to Tom, and she said, Tom, it was your lunch that was eaten, stolen. You set the punishment. And he said, without any delay, 15 stripes without that jacket on. And Jim began to cry. He said, oh, please, ma'am, please, ma'am, I'll take 30 licks. Just please don't make me take off my jacket. And she said, I'm sorry, but the, the judgment is in. And she took the jacket off and ripped it off his back, and there he stood, a skinny, frail, malnutritioned little boy with no shirt. And at that point, you could have heard a pin drop in that classroom. And Tom, the one who had laid his judgment out, stepped forward and he said, Oh, teacher, please let me take the stripes for him. I'll take his punishment. Let, let Jim go free. And you know, we're all guilty from one time to another. And there was someone who walked Calvary's hill. And he said, Father, let me take their place. I'll take the punishment. Let them go free. And here we are tonight with a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And we are free. We're free to rejoice here tonight. We're free to do whatever we feel pleases God and to share in various ways. Reminds me of a song that my father's church used to sing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a
He's washed you white as snow tonight if you desire it. It's done. All you have to do is receive.
Dino Kartsanakis. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Cheryl, for that beautiful little story. Are you all having a good time tonight? Yeah. Praising the Lord from one of America's great and historic churches. If you've just flipped by and joined us tonight, our Praise the Lord program comes to you tonight from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I'm going to introduce our very special guest and speaker tonight. He's never been introduced in his own church quite this way, I'm sure. In fact, Dr. Kennedy and I were privileged to be together a few days ago in Washington, D.C., and we got to meet our president, President George Bush, in the Oval Office, would you believe? And uh, we were talking on the elevator. Yes. George and I are getting to know one another a little bit. <laughs> we have a wonderful president, by the way. We really do. He's a great man and doing a good job. And I think he should have gotten Noriega. <clears throat> yeah. Anyhow, how did I get onto that? <clears throat> we were talking in the elevator, and uh, I was mentioning this to my friends. This was Dr. Kennedy, and he chided me a little bit, and he said, please, Paul, you can call me Jim. So one knows they have arrived in this club when you can refer to the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church as Jim. I've made it. I have made it. You see, I was taught <laughs> as a youth that I should respect my elders and my peers. <laughs> but I suddenly realized I have grown up along with the rest of these good people and I've gotten a little old myself. So uh, it's just a joy to be here today and to get acquainted with many more of our dear friends here in South Florida and to get to be with Dr. James Kennedy here in this great historic Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. So would you give your pastor a great praise the Lord welcome tonight? Jim. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for those kind words. I'm only uh, sorry that uh, my father wasn't here to, to hear that. He would have appreciated it. <laughs> my mother would have believed it. I asked Paul just how old he was. I asked him when was his birthday. And uh, he said, April 12. I said, what year? <laughs> he said, every year. Well, we are delighted to have uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network and praise the Lord with us today. Why, we've got so much enthusiasm here tonight, we might even unthaw God's frozen chosen here. I have already been blessed. I, I thought the music tonight was uh, exceptionally good. I, I just praise God for all of these wonderful talents that we've heard tonight. Uh, Dean and Mary and uh, Chris and Dino. Sherry, wonderful, wonderful talents. Isn't it amazing how, how music <clears throat> can conjure up so many <clears throat> pictures and so many emotions in the mind and heart? Uh, who did not see Eric Little running a few moments ago uh, with his head gone up, lifted up to heaven? And I was thinking about his words, God made me, and God made me fast. And he felt that he must run for the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> when Chris was singing one of my favorite hymns, 
It is well with my soul. Uh, they're welled up within my soul, uh, an emotion that always seems to come when I, when I hear that song. It's such an incredible song. You know, it was written by a man who had just lost his whole family in a shipwreck. And, and I can never hear that without thinking of a young American boy, Air Force pilot, Second World War, 19 years old, grew up in a Christian home back somewhere in the central part of America. He was flying his plane over the South Pacific, and it came right out of the sun, 11 o'clock high. He never saw it until it was practically on him. It was a Japanese Zero. He whipped his plane over into a roll, dove for the ocean, but the pilot was on his tail, and he was expert, and he, no matter what he did, turn and flip and everything else, he couldn't get away. He headed high. Finally, the machine guns of the Japanese plane hit their target, and the plane began to spin down out of control and crashed into the jungles of some small, sparsely populated island in the middle of the South Pacific. The boy was badly injured. He managed to crawl away from his plane a, a few yards, and there he lay, halfway around the world from his home back in America. Severely injured, bleeding profusely, he was surely going to die. What thoughts would fill the mind of a person dying in those hopeless, helpless circumstances? When they found his body, a few weeks later, they pried open one hand, and they found a crumpled piece of paper on which he had written these few words. When peace like a river. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, thou hast taught me to sing, it is well with my soul. How marvelous it is that the wondrous grace of God can bring such peace and joy even in the midst of situations like that. Well, that's not what I'm preaching about tonight, but I just couldn't help but uh, think of that. And every time I hear that, I can't help but feel when you hear that, you're going to think about that young man and the peace that God can break, bring to a human soul. I preached a message on television. Of course, it was carried by Trinity Broadcasting as well just recently, and I received a note from someone who said, you mentioned in your sermon recently a number of times the term grace, but you never told us what it means. Tonight, I'd like to talk about that glorious concept, that central truth of the Christian faith, amazing grace, just what is it? I don't know what your favorite passage of Scripture is, it is, but one of mine is certainly the second chapter of Ephesians. This is a marvelous pa passage with such texts as, if you've ever wondered, why would God have done such a thing as give his Son for us? I discovered the reason in there, in that passage, many and many a year ago, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Yes, if, if biblical passages could be likened unto mountains, these would be the Himalayas. And one text stands out above them all, rising high into the sky, snow-clad, surrounded with clouds of mystery. It is, I think, the very pinnacle of biblical revelation, and it shares with us that great truth, that one central truth that God wants us to know, and that is, by grace ye are saved. You know, grace is the most important concept in the world. It's the most important concept in the Bible. Now, I know some of you are saying, did not the Apostle Paul say that the greatest was love? No, he didn't. What he actually said was that now there abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. 
And what a glorious concept that is. Yes, but if grace had entered into the lists, love would have had to step into the shadows. For grace is greater than love. It is not, however, a concept that abides. In the vast panorama of eternity, grace has appeared and will have appeared only for a very brief period of time for our sojourn here on this earth. Before that tragic event at Eden, there was no grace. And when we arrive at last in heaven, and eternity opens up before us in all of its glorious vistas, there will be no grace. There will be no grace for those in hell who will be beyond its reach, and there will be no grace for those just men made perfect now living with all holy angels in paradise above, for there will be no need for grace. Grace does not abide. But during this time, when it is the day of grace, it shines more brilliantly even than love, because it is love raised by many powers above. In fact, it seems that Paul, as a master chemist, took test tubes and beakers of liquids of various hues, reds and purples and crimsons and greens, and poured them together into some great chemical apparatus. And when they'd run through all of that vast apparatus, at last there was distilled one pure crystalline drop, grace. And it is by grace that we are saved. Therefore, my friend, if we do not know what grace is, we cannot be saved. And I would ask you today, what, what is grace? What is this text, by grace you are saved, that rises like some Everest even above the rest of the Himalayas? I hope that today we might take a climb up that mountain to examine something of its glories. And I, for one, feel ill-equipped to lead that trek you stand lame of foot and feeble when you look up into the heights of the grace of God. But let us at least see how far we can ascend. Many and many a year ago, I remember reading a story that deeply touched me and says something, I, be, I believe, about the meaning of grace. We would have to go back 125 years or so, till the middle of the last century, in Tsarist Russia, out in the hinterlands. And there, as you look over the vast panorama of the steeps of Russia, frozen and white, as you focus in, you can see, traveling across those vast expanses of ice, a dog sled. And if you get close enough, you will descry thereon a Russian nobleman, and at his side his faithful servant of many and many a year. They've been traveling far for several hundreds of miles, and now at last their destination, which is home, is only about 20 miles ahead. They are rejoicing at the prospect of a warm bed and hot food. And the servant is examining the horizons on each side, and he looks behind him, and there is a sight which freezes his blood. About a mile or so behind them, he sees a large, dark mass. And as he peers closer, he sees that it is a horde of wolves who have caught their scent and now are inexorably closing upon the dog sled. They give the reins to the dogs and snap the whip and cry whatever the Russian equivalent of mush is, and the dogs lean into the harness to make as much speed as they can. And yet, still, this herd of wolves, this pack of wolves draws closer. Now they're but a half a mile, a quarter of a mile, a few hundred yards, 50 yards, 10, 5, 
They're right behind them. You can hear their heavy breathing. Their red eyes seem like red hot coals out of the very pit of hell. You can see their yellow fangs now dripping with saliva at the thought of their next meal. There is no place to hide. There's no place to go. They can't outrun them. Their situation is hopeless. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, this old servant throws himself backward off of the dog sled with predictable results. The pack stops, converges, and his master is spared. And I said to myself then, that is grace. But on more mature reflection, I realize that that is but the foothills of grace. It does at least bring out one aspect, as it were, to look in one facet of this precious diamond of grace, that grace involves a great sacrifice, even the sacrifice of one's own life. And yet, this does not yet come close to the shining pinnacle, the snow-clad peak of the Everest of grace. It would have come closer if the master had given himself for the servant. But let's go on. I became a Christian 35 years ago, and just about that time, there was a story that made the newspapers across this country. It even made the cover of Life magazine. Some of you folks as old as Paul and I may remember. It was a picture of a whole platoon of Marines with their arms ready, wading through a river. And some of them were carrying on their shoulders in body bags the corpses of five American missionaries that had left their colleges and gone down to Ecuador in the depths of the jungles of that nation, they had sought to bring the gospel to the most primitive, savage people on the face of the earth, the Alca Indians. They had prepared themselves well, they thought, They'd even devise a method whereby their plane could circle in a tight circle high above with a rope several thousand feet long that they could lower down with all sorts of gifts in a basket and it would just hover in one place and they could take them out. They did this for weeks at a time because, you see, they'd had no contact with the outside world, these Alcas. They killed every living person of any kind that entered their jungle. And so at last they felt comfortable to land their plane on the beach of the river. At first a couple of women came out and then a young man and then some more. And for several days they reported in each day that things were going well. They had gained their confidence and their friendship and they hoped that soon they would be able to proclaim the gospel to them. And these were outstanding young men. Some of you will remember them, Jim Elliott, his wife, Elizabeth, has written such glorious books about their exploits through gates of splendor. Nate Saint. In fact, these men were valedictorians at their colleges, champion of the wrestling team, poets. In fact, Jim Elliott, in his senior year at college, less than a year before, had written some words in a diary. And I recall reading those and being awestruck that any college senior could write words like these, words that, that to me seemed almost on a parable of that soliloquy of Hamlet, to be or not to be. He was meditating upon a biblical text in his senior year in college, and he was looking at the text that said, he makes his ministers a flame of fire. And these were his musings recorded in his diary. 
Am I ignitable? Deliver me, O Lord, from the dread asbestos of other things, that I may be a flame, but flame is short-lived. Canst thou bear this, O my soul, short life? Yet in me there dwells the spirit of the great, short-lived, whose zeal for his father's house consumed me, consumed him. Make me thy fuel, O flame of God. Less than a year later, that fuel was consumed. Out of the bushes they came, a whole horde of these alcas with eight-foot spears, and they plunged them through their bodies. The Marines were sent in to bring out the bodies. Sometime later, at a hotel over here on Pompano Beach, I heard the father of one of these men speak. He was a great hulk of a man. I would say he was about six foot four, 240 or 50 pounds. He looked like a linebacker for the Dolphins. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, when I found out what they had done to my only son, I got on a plane in Minneapolis and I flew to Miami and then I flew to Quito, Ecuador, and I went on a train and I got a safari and I got a group of people and we went right into that jungle, into their village, and I found the savage that had killed my son. And he said, I went to him and I put my arms around him and I said, in the name of Jesus, I love you. And I about melted right under the table. And I said, that is grace. But I was wrong. It's getting closer. But it is not yet the full quintessence, the distillation of what the grace of God, the, the amazing grace of God really means. Yes, you see, this brings us to the fact of a greater sacrifice, even than laying down one's life, the sacrifice of giving one's own son. Ah, uh, but there is more, much more, to the grace of God, that grace by which we are saved, and without which no man may be saved. It was the 1920s, Oklahoma. His name was John Griffith, and he dreamt of travel. He was a young man in his early 20s. He had just married. They had an infant son. And he dreamt of faraway places with strange-sounding names, and he read about them and studied about them, and he was going to be a world traveler. And then came 1929. And in the great crash of American economy and in the howling winds, Oklahoma was turned into a desolate and hopeless state. And with that crash went all his dreams. And he packed up all of his few belongings and his wife and his little son, Greg, in an old Model A, and they headed east. And they made their way to Missouri until the edge of the Mississippi River, and there he found a job, a job tending one of the great railroad bridges that spans the mighty Mississippi. And it was his job, day by day, to sit in the great control house and to take these huge gears and open this massive bridge to let the barges and the ships go by and then close it again for the trains to roar across the river. And he used to think and contemplate where these ships were going and what wonderful places they would see. It was in 1937 that for the first time he brought his now eight-year-old son, Greg Griffith, to work with him. 
And his son was wide-eyed as he saw his father press a lever and saw this huge bridge rise or come down again at his father's will. Surely his father was the greatest man in the world. He controlled this magnificent bridge. And when lunchtime came, they took their lunchbox and he put the, the bridge up in the air to allow some boats that were scheduled to come by to pass. And, and he went with his son out uh, into the river over a catwalk out to an observation deck that was about 50 feet out in the river. And there they could see the boats as they passed by. They opened their lunch and they ate. And his father was telling his son wonderful stories about these wonderful places. And time passed and he was about in the midst of telling him about the time that the river overflowed with tragic results. And right in the middle of that, he was suddenly awakened out of his reverie by the shriek of the whistle of a train. And he looked at his watch quickly and saw that the 107, the Memphis Express, was due in just a couple of minutes. He didn't panic. He told his son to stay where he was. He leaped to his feet and quickly jumped onto the catwalk, walk, ran back, climbed the steel ladder into the control house, looked up the river to see that no ships were coming down again, and then, according to custom, he looked under the bridge to see that there was nothing there, and there came to his eyes a sight that made his heart leap into his throat as he looked down into this huge, massive room, this gearbox, as it was called, where there were tons of gears that moved this gigantic bridge. And there, between the teeth of the two main cogs of that gearbox, was his son, Greg, who had tried to follow his father back and fallen off the catwalk down into this huge room full of gears below. He was conscious, but his leg was trapped between the teeth of the gear. If he were to lower the bridge, he would most certainly kill his son. What could he do? Immediately, he formed a plan. He would take the rope that was coiled over there. He would climb down the ladder, run up the catwalk, tie off the rope, go down, free his son, bring him back up, come back, climb the ladder, and throw down the lever and put the bridge down for the train. And no sooner had he thought it than he knew that he didn't have half enough time for that. What would he do? His mind was panicked. His blood was frozen. What could he do? There were 400 people on that train that was roaring toward that bridge, which was sitting like this. Soon it would come out of the trees at tremendous speed. But this, this was his son. This was his only child, his son. Her mother, his mother waited at home. He was a father, but this was his boy. And he knew what he had to do. So he buried his head in his left arm and plunged the lever forward. And just as the bridge settled into place, the Memphis Express with 400 passengers roared out of the trees and across the river. And John Griffith, John Griffith lifted up his tear stained face and he looked right into the windows of the passing train and there was a businessman reading the morning paper and a uniformed conductor looking at his large vest pocket watch and there were ladies sipping coffee in the dining car and a little child pushing a long spoon into a deep dish of ice cream but no one looked at him no one looked at the control house. No one looked down into the gear room with the massy gears and the mangled remains of all of his hopes and dreams. And he pounded on the glass and he said, What's the matter with you people? Don't you care? Don't you know I sacrifice my son for you? What's wrong with you? And no one answered. No one heeded. No one looked. A 
that no one cared, and the train roared out of sight across the river. And when I read that account, I said, Ah, oh, ah, oh, that, that is grace. But it's not. No, we're above the tree line now. We're at the base of the ice and the snow that forever surrounds that mountain. To see the meaning of that, that astounding, that astonishing, that amazing grace of God. I sat once in a living room one night sharing the gospel with some people. And uh, they were telling me, as so many people have, how their hopes and expectations of entering heaven were based upon the fact that they had lived reasonably decent and good sort of lives. In fact, only last night I had some people telling me that again. And I told these people, a story which I hoped would pierce through the hardness of their hearts and would enlighten their minds. I said, <clears throat> suppose that right now, suddenly your front door was kicked open <clears throat> and a half a dozen policemen with drawn guns rushed into the room, threw me onto the floor, put my hands behind me, handcuffed me, picked me up, and hauled me out of your house. And you said, what, what are you doing? Well, this is, this is a, a minister in church here. And the policeman says, you, you just think this is a minister in church here. This man is a complete phony. He is wanted in seven states for multiple murders and bank robberies. You are lucky that we got here in time. You probably would not have survived the night. And you read and watch carefully the news of my trial and of my conviction and of my sentencing that I am sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair. And you say to your wife, <clears throat> well, we have said that we, we believe in the golden rule to do unto others and that we love other people, then we should try to go down and do something for him. And you go down to the judge and you say, we want to help him. We'll do anything at all. What can we do? And you even go so far to say, I will lay down my life for him. And the judge says, no, that, that, that would not suffice. You see, this man killed many people, robbed many banks. However, we, we would accept the offer of a child. And you go home and think about that, for you have but one child, 12-year-old girl. And you pray and you talk and you agonize and finally you decide to do it and you come back and you bring your daughter, Mary Ann. The judge says, however, you must be the one to do it. You see, it was not a centurion that inflicted that penalty upon Christ to pay for the sins of the world. It was his own father that poured out an infinite wrath upon him. And so you shave her head and place her in the chair and put the bands on her wrists and ankles and while she cries, Daddy, Daddy, why have you forsaken me? You pull the switch until she is dead. Several days later, you're sitting in a restaurant the funeral was just that morning. You have no desire to prepare food or even to eat it. You're sitting in a booth talking to each other. 
the warden has instructed the guards to go to my cell, inform me of what you had done, and to tell me that because of that sacrifice, I am free to go. And so I have been released from prison, and I walk into that restaurant and sit in the booth next to you. You see me, but I don't see you. And my friend says to me, Kennedy, I read in the paper that you were guilty. They were going to cook your goose. What happened? And you overhear me say to him, well, you see, it was all a big mistake. There are many people I didn't kill. There are many banks I never robbed. In fact, I even put some money into one or two. And so they looked at my character and my life, and they decided that I, that I was really a pretty nice person. And on the basis of my character and morality, they decided to let me go. And you're sitting in the next booth, and you know that the only reason that I am walking around alive is because of a small grave on the west side of town with the name of Marianne. Now that is grace. Not quite. To reach the peak, we would have to change the story. I wasn't just a visitor in your home. No, I was one that had come into your home several weeks before when you were away, and I had raped and killed your wife. And now you give your daughter to die for me. Jesus didn't die for friends, like the friend of the nobleman. Jesus didn't die for strangers, like those on the train. Jesus didn't die for nice people, like a visiting pastor in your home. No, Jesus died for his enemies. While we were yet at enmity with God, Christ died for us. That, my friends, is the meaning of grace. And it is by grace, totally unmerited favor to those who deserve positive disfavor is the meaning of grace. To the undeserving, to the ill-deserving, to the hell-deserving, God offers eternal life, not because of anything that we have done. Ah, dear friend, if you have never received that grace, I urge you to do it even now. If you're here in this sanctuary, if you're watching across the nation, I urge you to do it right now. You don't have to plead your virtues. You don't have to plead what great accomplishments you've made. You see, there's only one thing that you can add. There's only one thing that you do add to your salvation, and that is you provide. You provide the sin for which Christ died. By God's grace, he changes our hearts. By his grace, he brings us to repentance and faith. Not because of anything that we are or that we have done, but in spite of everything that we have done. Most people try to claim their virtues and to minimize their sins, but if you want to be accepted by God, maximize your sins. Don't extenuate them. You say, my sins are bad enough, I should maximize them. My friend, you don't know one hundredth of the sin that clings to your soul. So if you were to maximize it ten times over, you would still be extenuating your own sin. Grant to God all of your sins. Admit them all, and his grace will come and flow and cleanse your life like a sparkling river, and you can say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That grace comes through a conduit, that conduit, however, is not round like a pipe. It's shaped like a cross. 
And it's only there at Calvary that there is the outlet for the grace of God. That pure crystalline river of God's grace flows through that cross to all that will turn from their sins, admit their guilt, and place their trust in Him. You can know assuredly that you have eternal life. You can know that you are forgiven because the great God of heaven has given His only begotten Son to die for His enemies, including me, that you and I might have eternal life. Would you like to receive that gift? <clears throat> Would you like to know? Invite Jesus Christ to come with His grace into your life, to cleanse it, to transform it, to cause it to blossom and bloom like the rose and to put a song in your heart forevermore that you can forever sing amazing grace. How sweet the song, the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Come, come to the cross of Christ and receive that amazing grace. May we pray. Father, right now, throughout this nation, there are those who have heard for the first time the wonder of your grace, that astonishing grace that no human being would ever have conceived of. Lord, I pray that your spirit will touch their hearts cause them to see their sin, that they have sinned against one who has loved them with a love that no human being could ever understand. We can never scale its heights or plumb its depths or understand its infinite meaning. But Lord, may they say right now, O oh Christ, I have no virtue, I have no goodness, I am stained with sin within and without. But O oh Christ, I kneel at the cross, and may the river, the river of your grace, pour into me and flood my soul. I accept you, Lord Jesus. I cling to that cross. I rejoice in that grace. And I will until the day I die, on which day I too may say, Peace, like a river, attendeth my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Like a master painter, Dr. Kennedy is painted on a canvas, a portrait of grace that we will never forget. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. I don't think I truly understood what God's grace was as well as I understand it tonight. How about you? The scripture says, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Prayer partners are standing by right now to take your call and your confession of faith. Who would not wish to know a God who has this kind 
of grace. Sing it one more time, and those of you that haven't received him even in this room, you can do it even now as we sing it one more time from our hearts. many in this room tonight have experienced that amazing grace of God in your life. Lift your hand as a testimony of that marvelous grace of God. Oh, blessed be his wonderful name. Laverne and Edith Tripp sing a song that says the grace of God a little differently, but just as eloquently. A grand old hymn that will bless you as they come. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. I would like to tell you what I think of Jesus. For I found in him, oh, he's a friend, so strong, and he's true. How he came, and he changed my life completely. ever do what Jesus will do. He will come and he'll slip his loving arms around you. And he'll lead you in the way that you should go.
Well, nobody knows the grace of God any more than I do. I'm so grateful for His grace. And I don't think I've ever heard it explained more beautiful than tonight. And it's so real tonight. I ran from God for such a long time, and maybe some of you here have ran from Him. My reason was I never felt like I was good enough to receive what He was offering to me. And I realize now I wasn't, but He did it anyway. And oh, how precious that is. I knew the Lord called me to be a minister. I knew He called me to be an evangelist as a little boy. But I never thought I could live a good enough life. I know now I can't. But I know if I will yield my will to Him, that He can through me and will. But we just have to continue to surrender. And maybe you've grown hard and cold and selfish and indifferent. Let the grace of God tonight deliver you and set you free. Storms hit all of us. No matter what walk we come from, it may be financial storms or physical storms or spiritual storms, but the good news in all of it is Jesus always comes in the midst of that storm. He sees where you are tonight. Our family is not exempt from them. Just because we're in the ministry and just because we're on TV, we're not exempt from them. It was 15 years ago that I rededicated my life. What a storm I was in. I was so bound by alcohol and other drugs. I was so bound by selfishness and pride. I never thought there was any way I'd ever have life because I didn't seem, it didn't seem that I could reach that place of freedom. But through His grace and only His grace, because all I said was, Lord, will you forgive me? I knew I'd lied. I knew I'd deceived. I knew I'd rebelled. And the only way I know to describe it, it was like chains had me bound. They just broke. It was like a weight was on my chest. It just lifted. And I knew that the grace of God had been extended to me, and every sin I had committed had been forgiven, not because I gave anything, not because I did anything, that's just the way God is. God is a good God, and He's no respecter of person. And I committed that day, Lord, I'll follow you. And I've continued to do so. Though there have been times I have stumbled and failed. Though there have been times like Peter, I stepped out of the boat and was walking on the water, my eyes on Jesus, but then I began to see the storm and the wind, and I started sinking. But every time I started sinking, I just said, Lord, save me. And he reached out his hand and picked me up and led me back to the boat, back to safety. And I know tonight that many of you watching, that's where you are. Maybe many of you in this room, you have forgotten it was His grace, thinking it was your works, and you know you have failed. And if you'll be honest, you know that. Accept that grace again. Accept that cleansing. Jesus sees you toiling and rowing and struggling in that condition that you're in because of the storm that has hit you, but He's passing by. And in the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter is where the Lord gave me this song. Jesus told his disciples to get into a boat and to go to the other side of the lake. They got in the boat, started across the lake, and when they got out in the middle of that lake, a storm hit them. They began to toil and row, trying to get to the shore. And the Bible says the whole time they were toiling and rowing, Jesus was standing watching them. And about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, he came walking on the water, and they saw him, and they cried out, and he stepped on board that ship, and he said to those men, peace. And he turned to that storm and he said, be still. And immediately the storm stopped and they were safely on the other shore. Right this very moment, God Almighty sees you toiling and rowing in that storm. But Jesus is passing by. You speak his name. You call on him because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved and he will step on board your ship and he will give you peace and you will make it safely to the other shore because he always comes 
in the midst of the storm. When you reach out for help and you find no one there and the darkness moves in all each side just remember that God is always watching in love and in his loving arms you can always hide for Jesus comes in the midst of the storm to deliver his children from harm when that storm gets so rough he will say that's enough when he comes in the midst of the storm he has power to heal and deliver from sin he has power to stop that troublesome wind why there's nothing too hard for the savior to do why not reach out to him for he's reaching now to you for jesus comes in the midst of your storm to deliver his children from harm when that storm gets so rough he will say that's enough when he comes in the midst of your storm when your storm gets so good he will say that's enough when he comes in the midst of the storm Jesus comes in the midst of Thank you, Laverne and Edith. Oh, my. I feel like I've been to church already. How about you? <laughs> and now, in just a little bit, Dr. Hill is going to come and bless us with another great word from the Lord. But before he does that, will our usher brother come right now, please? Those of you who have prepared your offering, we want to cover all of the expenses of this wonderful two nights here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church and I've, many of you have already prepared your offering those of you across America if you enjoy seeing the Holy Beamer roll to great places like Coral Ridge and other places across America we need to hear from you too so uh, just address your love gifts and your letters to TBN PO Box A Santa Ana California 92711 if you're making out a check, just make it out to TBN, and we'll see that it's used to meet the expenses. We want to be sure and cover all of our needs and expenses of this crusade here at Coral Ridge. And then if there's any left over, as I said, I promise we'll use every penny to keep your channel 45 on the air 
here in the Gold Coast of South Florida. God bless you. Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving to keep your great gospel going out across America and around the world. Thank you, Lord, for this word about your glorious grace tonight that has touched so many thousands of lives across this land. We praise you for the grace of God that we too have experienced and received. Bless us now as we give to you that this gospel may continue to be preached in all the world for a witness. For we know that your coming draweth nigh as even at the door. Bless us as we give now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So many cold and lonely souls on the streets tonight. Where's the light? Where's the light? And that lonely prisoner in his cell, the toss and turn all night. Where's the light? Where's the light? I've been sitting here in my easy chair with what I just heard be right. I'm the light. I'm the light. So I'll get up and go and let my actions show That Jesus in me makes things right Cause I'm the light I'm the light I'm the light To that boy and girl with no mom and dad little hug would be all right, but where's the light? Where's the light? Where's the light? To that hungry man in a foreign land, a little food would make things right, but where's the light? been sitting here in my easy chair but what I just heard be right I'm the light I'm the light so I'll get up and go and let my actions show that Jesus in me makes things right I'm the light I'm the light Sing it with me I'll get up and go So I'll get up and go And let my actions show That Jesus in me Makes things right Cause I'm the light I'm the light I'm the light Trip family, thank you, thank you, thank you. Where in the world but on Christian television could you have Dr. James Kennedy and Evie Hill all in the same night? <laughs> Dear Lord. NBC, ABC, CBS, eat your heart out. You haven't anything like we've got tonight here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And when you get a great church like this, all mixed up with lights and cameras and a TV transmitter and a satellite and a holy beamer, 
it spells one thing. The devil's in big trouble. He is in big trouble. Yes. Now, E.V. Hill doesn't need me to introduce him tonight. I have only one problem with Pastor Hill's preaching. It isn't long enough. That's the only problem I have. Pastor Hill, we've saved the whole last hour for you, so you just take your liberty in the Lord. From South Central Los Angeles, pastor of another great historic church, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, give Pastor E.V. Hill a great South Florida welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Let us pray. And our gracious and heavenly Father, we would pray that thou would please permit us to preach your word, not for fame nor reputation, but to the end that you would use it to save tonight cause men and women, boys and girls throughout the world to say yes to Jesus Christ. Cause those who are listening to us who have said yes, but who have strayed to get up right now and come home tonight. Thank you, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. There's some things I there's some things I asked the Lord to let my mama see. She's in glory now, and so is my wife. Uh, but uh, I hope He'll let them see me at Coral Ridge tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, reared in a very poor community and lived in a two-room log cabin. I finished high school out of a two-room log cabin uh, with a little kitchen attached to it. And uh, I've been trying to see how far is it from here <laughs> back to that log cabin. <laughs> and it's a long way. <laughs> So to all of you all in Sweet Home, hello out there. I'm, I'm at Coal Ridge. I don't know where I'll be next week, but I'm here today. <laughs> I have been fortunate to have been here before, and I want to thank Pastor Kennedy for his continuing ministry of the Word. And I want to thank my brother and sister Paul and Jan. Uh, I've been traveling for the last uh, nine days down in Texas and Tennessee, and uh, everywhere I go, they say, you are Paul and Jan's friend. Uh, and I said, yes, I am. And boy, y'all have made me popular. I tell you the truth. <laughs> I mean, all in the airport and everybody. And, uh, I was on a freeway in Houston, and a lady cut in front of us, and then we cut around her, and then... She came up beside us and blew and waved. And, I mean, we're on a freeway, you know. They don't do that in, in, in Los Angeles. And out in Los Angeles, if you're on a freeway, if you're not a Dodger, you will be an angel. <laughs> and so finally, we got off the freeway, and she got off the freeway, and we stopped at the red light, and she pulled right in front of us and jumped out and said, you're E.V. Hill with Paul and Jan. Give me your autograph. I said, Lord, have mercy. So you all take it easy. <laughs> so what a joy it is to be here tonight and to bring you greetings from all of the friends all over the country. Uh, when Dr. Kennedy got through, I said to uh, someone, Dr. Hill needs to leave now. <laughs> as a preacher of the gospel. I want to talk about three of my motivations for accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I have accepted him 
as my personal Savior. I did it when I was 11 years old. I have not been lost since. I have been saved since I was 11 years old. I was born in the family in such a way that he could never put me out. So I'm, I'm just in there. Good, bad, and what have you, but I'm in there. Whippings and everything else, but I'm in there. Like Mama, he'd take the Board of Education and hit, hit my seat of consciousness, but I'm, I'm still in there. Uh, I've accepted Jesus Christ <clears throat> as my personal Savior and did when I was 11 years old. I had a real moving experience uh, when I was 17 that even in a greater way confirmed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've come tonight to ask somebody who's here in this auditorium, somebody here tonight in this auditorium, and then the thousands and millions of people who are listening to us, I've come to ask you, to plead with you, to beseech you, to beg of you to do the greatest thing that you have, could ever do, and that is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior not to increase the membership role of the Christian churches, not to uh, increase the role of the Mount Zion Church or the Coleridge Church, uh, but to accept him in order that you will be saved. Uh, that's our motivation, that's our reason, is accepting him. I have led many people to Christ who I have not led to become members of the church I pastor. So I want everybody saved, but there's some folk I don't particularly want to pastor. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I get them saved and then recommend the church down the street. <laughs> if they're cold or cheap, I recommend them down the street. And if they, if they don't like to stay in church long, I don't like for them to stay at Mount Zion. We, st we take up at 10.45, we get out at 2.15. Now, if, if that's a little long for you, there's one right down the street. Get out in 30 minutes, right down the street. Now, don't disturb my peace at the church where I pass, <laughs> because I'm getting old now and I don't rush. <laughs> but I do have uh, three, uh, well, let's deal with three, maybe four, personal reasons why I'm glad and I did accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. The first one is, <clears throat> I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> <All right. laughs> All right. And uh, my mama taught me that hell is a place. Now, she didn't have a degree in science, and she didn't know nothing about uh, the earth and all of the workings of the earth. But mama told me that the Bible said that there is a place, not a state of mind, not a bad thought, not a dream after you've had some cabbage, but, uh, but a place called hell. And the old preacher talked about hell so. First of all, he said, ain't nobody invited you to hell. If you go, you're going without an invitation. The devil hadn't invited you to come to hell. Jesus says, come to heaven. But he hadn't invited you. And it's wrong to go to a place where you haven't been invited to. You ought to. You ought to stay out of here. And the old preachers used to preach about hell so. For an instant, uh, one preacher, uh, I think it was Pastor Green when I was a boy, he preached so about hell and he described living a sinful and a sinner life. He says it's like swinging across hell holding on to a spider web. Well, now, I, I needed something better than that. I, I, if you don't have but a spider web chance, 
you, you better get something better than that. He said, it's just like swinging across hell, blazing fire. And I know that it is not uh, the latest and the most intellectual thing to discuss. I know that some of you might be intimidated or even insulted by me suggesting to you that there is an eternal hell, but I want to tell you, it is. There's some fire somewhere down there. Amen. Every time these bright boys come up with there ain't no fire, then a mountain blows up and the fire is eight miles into the sky. It's some fire somewhere down there. Every time they claim ain't no fire, nowhere the lava starts coming up. It's some fire somewhere down there. Now fire isn't the only thing that I dread about hell, but there's some fire down there. And I don't want to go to hell. Now, Mama told me, and the Bible says that hell is a place. It is a place. Now, it, it is logical to me because if heaven is a place where all of those who want to be with God, then God should have a place. He would on, he's only just to have a place where those who don't want to be with him can have somewhere to go. Amen. I want to make an announcement right here on the air, right here on television, right here at Coral Ridge. I want to make an announcement to everybody who's listening to me. There'll be nobody in heaven saying, I didn't want to come up here in the first place. <laughs> you won't be in heaven. You won't be in heaven talking about mama just drug me on up here. Mama can't drag you into heaven. Now, she can drag and has drugged you in many places, but she can't drag you into heaven. If you go to heaven, it will be a conscious decision on your part to accept God's provision for those who would go to heaven. You can't even say, well, you know, I, I heard my girlfriend was up here, so I decided to come. It, 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 it won't work out that way. You may have John Cole Ridge because your girlfriend was here, and thank God for that. Maybe you got saved in the meantime. But you will not go to heaven because your girlfriend is there, you'll go to heaven because you have consciously, you have willingly, you have openly and without shame said, I want to be saved, and you have accepted God's provision for salvation, and it ain't but one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Psalms 9 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell. Psalms 135 says, though I make my bed in hell. All of the gospels put together says, don't fear those that can just cast your body, but fear those who can cast your body and soul. And so hell is a place. Now, before you decide and before you turn me off, let's discuss this idea uh, that it is a place. It is a place where, number one, there is no love of God. Now, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be anywhere. One of the marvels of his grace during this age is that the love of God is shed abroad on the just and the unjust. That the love of God, 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 God is so wonderful and wise. The love of God is reigning right here in Fort Lauderdale upon the just and the unjust, the saved and the unsaved. And that's one of the confusing things about this church age where God's mercy is just being poured out. God's grace is just abounding on us. That is, some people who have not accepted Christ but who enjoy the grace and the goodness of Christ sometimes don't see the need of accepting Christ. Because to be very truthful with you, sometimes their arthritis is not as bad as ours. Sometimes they own the building where Christians rent. Sometimes church folk are catching buses and sinners are driving by in limousines. 
And you kind of wonder here, you know, who's in control? I mean, who's metering out all these blessings? Look like they got it all mixed up. Hey, I'm the Christian over here. This is God's world, and the drug dealer, which is confusing a whole lot of young people, will pass by in a limousine. And you own minimum wedge, and you love God, and many of them don't care for him at all. And so sometimes it, 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 it kind of gets confused, you know. If, if I were God, I'd have this thing so uh, that uh, you couldn't enjoy my goodness and not serve me. Oh, yeah, I'd have this house full every day praying. Give you the whooping cough if you didn't come. But ain't God wonderful? Isn't he marvelous? You wake up on Sunday morning and, and start looking at a baseball game. I'd put a pain in the back of your head. You'd be at church in the next five minutes. But I ain't God, thank God. I'd get my own self in trouble. I'd hit myself one Sunday and forget I'm God. But anyway. But God's not like that. He reigns during this period with Frederick Sampson calls the parenthesis in eternity. He's reigning with goodness and mercy on all. And he's standing, though he's God, he's standing through those whom he hath chosen and sent, pleading, saying, come to me. But there'll come a time when those who do not accept Jesus Christ will only know the wrath of God. Just every now and then, he kind of lets us in on how he could be. He's holding back his hand right now. He just, he just, he just every now and then, he just taps us. Just said, well, why don't you act right? He wasn't trying to shake up uh, 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 the East Coast with Hugo. Oh, he just tapping. Just saying, get right. I think Hugo stood over some parts of South Carolina 39 minutes, and the devastation was more than we could even imagine. Now, suppose he decides to get rough and tell Hugo, swing back there and stand there five hours up in San Francisco. He wasn't trying to be rough with us. He just let that earth shake for 21 seconds. Suppose he got mad and said, go back there and stomp angels for three hours. Just jump up and down for three hours. That's all an earthquake is, just a bunch of angels out there jumping up and down. And suppose he said, jump up and down for three hours. If what happened in 20 seconds devastated us and almost ruined the economy and added taxes on to Californians and what have you, what would have happened if God had said, shake for three hours? And he can do it. The governor the next morning called in his uh, uh, consultants, his engineers, and uh, said, what happened? <laughs> and then they voted to hire a million-dollar consultant firm to see what happened because the bridges were not supposed to fall. He said, we have built them with the understanding that they won't fall, and they're going to pay a million dollars for a consultant fee, and I'm just a country Baptist preacher. I'll do it for nothing. I've never had engineering, but I'll tell you what happened. You just can't withstand God. That's what happened. Build it on up to a 10, he'll send a 12. Build it up to a 12, he'll send a 14. Your arms are too short to box with God. Oh, yeah, when God wants you, he can get you. Go ahead, go on fly 
to the islands and he'll send part of you go down there to bring you on back. When God wants you, he can get you. But hell is a place where there is no love of God. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go no place where I cannot feel the love of God. Sinner, listen to me tonight. You may not have accepted Christ, but you even live in a community where the love of God is all around you. Your parents and your friends have shared the love of God. Where you work, you have experienced the love of God. If you've ever been down and somebody helped you up, that was the love of God. The motivation of welfare is the love of God. The motivation of charity movements is the love of God. But what about a world where there is no love of God? I don't want to go to hell. When I heard Jesus saves from hell, I heard about everything else he does. And there are a lot of people that are being won today by all kinds of principles and what have you. Even out in Los Angeles, he makes you rich. He pays your bills. He, he gives you a Mercedes Benz and all that. And fine, I, I haven't met him on that order yet. But I know one thing. He saves. He turns around your destiny. He helps you. Bound for glory. Amen. And ain't that good news? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Paul and Jan knows I had real problems when the Lord took baby from me. Until he came in my room and explained through his spirit that she's on the streets of glory. That's when I gave him up. I had preached it a long time. You can preach your whole arts a long time and don't hear what you're saying. But he came through my room one night when my heart was broken and when I was bloody and bleeding. And he assured me that she's on the streets of glory. And then Christmas night, I walked out the backyard and looked up in the sky and it was prettier than it's ever been. And the stars were bright and twinkling. And I looked up and I said, well, you rascal." Your first Christmas in glory. <laughs> there is a place. I don't want to go because there's no love of God. I don't want to go because there's, there will be the continual wrath of God. I've had my shares of sorrow and problems and what have you, but thank God it's not continuous because I live in a world where God's mercy gives me a little rest and gives me a little comfort and we've all had our problems. If it's not one thing, it's another. I have a face that's quite bumpy. You can't see it because of my natural color, but uh, they don't have put powder on me, you know, just put me up. And, uh, but I have a bumpy face and by the time I get one hair and this is all smooth, another one will break out here. And I get this one all smooth and another one will come out under here. And this one and another one will come out. One thing after another. We are children of tribulations in this world because the world doesn't like us. Now, if the world doesn't happen to know that you are Christian, they ain't bothering you. But you better not ever show up. And you better not ever give any evidence that you love Jesus. Because if they hated him, they hate us. I don't want to go to hell. 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 Because the second, third reason why, there are no exits. You can't take a weekend in hell to see how you like it. If you fool around and go to hell, you're there forever. You're there forever. Jack Heil, Dr. Jack Heil, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. Y'all know Brother Heil, he sends his buses down there on Sunday morning to pick up Sunday school students uh, up in Hammond, Indiana. Uh, Jack Heil is, is quite a fellow. I think they have about 20,000 in Sunday school, and I think... They baptize about a hundred a week, and it's just soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. We were up in Michigan preaching together, and I said, Jack, 
I, I want, let me in on why you're just so caught up in soul winning, soul winning. When he hires a secretary, he doesn't ask her how many words she can type, how many souls do you win? When he hires a janitor, he doesn't even ask him, do you know how to mop? How many souls do you win? Just soul winning, soul winning. I say, you, you, you're on the verge of a fanatic. And uh, I said, now, what, what's behind? He said, well, Ed, it is a story. I said, please tell it to me. One night, early in the morning, I was asleep and all of a sudden I'm awakened by this piercing scream from my sister. And so I ran upstairs to her bedroom and there she was sweating and in hysterics and just screaming and I shook her and I couldn't get, then I had to just slap her. And she said when she came, oh Jack, Jack, Jack. She said, he said, what's wrong? You had a dream. No, no dream. You had a nightmare. No, no nightmare. It's real. What, what happened? She said, Jack, I just got back from hell. It wasn't a nightmare. It wasn't a dream. It's real. She said, you can almost feel the warmth of my flesh. And he said, well, tell me about it. She said, oh, Jack. After the few miles of the glitter and the lights and all of that which deceives mankind, there is nothing but desolation as you proceed towards hell. It is a bummed out situation. It's nothing but desolation and hopelessness as you walk towards the gates of hell knowing that you will never again see no good thing. And she said, Jack, I got to the gate of hell. <clears throat> and the innkeeper said, hold it. And I stood outside of the gate of hell and I saw people whose faces were twisted and tongues were thick and eyes bulging and hands thick and split and dropping blood. And I said, sir, please, let some air come in. And he said, no, no air in hell. And she said, I saw them just screaming and just vexation of all kinds. And she said, well then, kind sir, let them have a drink of water. No, no water in hell. He said, well then, she said, well please, let them die. Just let them die. Just let them die. And he said, no, no death in hell. And she said, oh my God, well then how long will they, there be the gnawing and the gashing and the bleeding and the fire unbearable and no water and no air. How long? He said forever and ever. For hell has no exit and there is no death. And she said, Jack, just as I turned, he told me, go back and tell the story. And just as I turned, I saw daddy. And Jack said, Ed, my daddy is in hell because he never got around to doing the most important thing. He schooled us, he fed us, he housed us, but he never got around to personally saying yes to Jesus Christ. And he said, so I win souls every day so that nobody else's daddy has to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be in a place where there's no exits. I have claustrophobia. <laughs> I don't want to be in a place where there is agony of body and spirit, where there is pain and suffering the wrath of God, no love of God. I don't want it. You can have it. 
I'm going where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. I'm going to a place where there is no more sickness and cancer and diabetes and all of the other problems. I'm going where we'll never grow. So you see, there's a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. I don't want to go to hell, and I beg of you, don't go to hell. Please don't. Please don't. You won't like it. You won't even like your neighbors. There'll be devils and demons and fallen angels and false prophets. Don't go to hell. Well, but preacher, I have a retirement, so it's going to run out even before you die. Don't go to hell. Work on the major matter. There is a comfort that I have. I appreciate the house I have, but it can be taken from me. I appreciate the pulpit that I preach out of and the wonderful people all over this land who give me faith, but it can disappear. You can be way up on the pole one morning and looking for a job the next, but I ain't going to hell. Hey. Would you do what I have them to do in Mount Zion? Turn around, shake somebody's hand right quick, say, I ain't going to hell. Amen, 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 amen. Ah, oh, but there's another motive. Now, first of all, and I, I wish I didn't have, I wish I wouldn't preach on, but there's just that motivation. I don't want to go to hell. That's enough to preach 40 years on. Don't go to hell. Jonah said, repent for a long time. So I could preach, just don't go to hell. <laughs> My wife, you know, uh, uh, I would call her every night. And I had preached that night on, you can go to hell. That's what I preached. That's one of your possibilities. And so she said, uh, how was the message tonight? I said, the Lord blessed. She said, what did you preach about? You can go to hell. She said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> and somebody in television audience or somebody in this auditorium, the spirit won't let me move on. So I must say again, don't go to hell. God has made it possible for you to have everlasting life. You're going to live everlastingly somewhere. So get all these crazy notions out of your head that because when life gets said, well, I just go out and kill myself and it's all over. No, it just begun. After death, judgment. You haven't done nothing by killing yourself but rushed yourself into hell. And so don't, don't do it because even when you get to hell, you find yourself alive. And won't it be bad to have all this hell on earth and then end up alive in hell? <laughs> Save yourselves from this untaught generation. But then I have a second reason, a second motivation that I share with you. I want something. I have lived a life where I have known limitations. I'm enjoying a few things right now, but they're even limited. I have known my background comes out of extreme poverty. I could look through the flow and count ants, and I could look through the ceiling and count birds. I've come up out of extreme poverty and Extreme, extreme discrimination and segregation. I know what it is to get a death notice at midnight from the Ku Klux Klan. I know what it is to get a death notice at noonday from the Black Panther Party. So I've had it in black and white. <laughs> Look like everybody want me dead. talking to somebody right now that you know what it is to be limited 
You have not enjoyed the fullness of your own potentiality. Life had not treated you that way. For one reason or the other, your stars have not twinkled. Your moon has not shined. Your sun has gone down too fast. Somebody that I'm talking to right now, maybe in a living room, you don't have nothing but due bills and overdrawn accounts. You ought to accept Jesus. I said, you ought to accept him. Because your plight might be, you might leave here just like that. I know we have a whole lot of folk on television saying, when you accept Jesus, you automatically become an Onassis and automatically become this. But I'm talking to a whole lot of folk, even in this building here, you have hewn that wood and tote that water and chop that row and life hadn't been no bundle of roses. You know what it is to try to struggle to keep breakfast on the table. In the church where I pastor, we have one rule. No woman leaves our church with only a dollar bill. If you're down to your last dollar, come see the pastor. And a couple of y'all deacons stay here with me. So if it overdraws me, I'll have some resources. <laughs> and one night as I began to say the benediction, I stopped in the middle of the benediction and said, all of y'all about to leave here with not a dollar. And you don't know where you're going to find breakfast. Raise your hand and 12, raise their hand. I said, come down here and stay here. Then I went on and gave the benediction. And one girl came up. I said, what's your problem? She said, Pastor, I don't know how you, I just don't know how you knew, but I, I came to church on fumes. I don't have no gas. I didn't have none when I left home. I, I just prayed that the fumes would bring me on to church. And she said, and doing church, I've just been praying, Lord, please don't let it run out on the freeway because I don't have nothing but fumes. And I went in my pocket and I said, well, how about a tank of gas? She's known nothing but limitations. Another one came up in tears in her eyes and said, Pastor, how did you know? I spent the whole worship just trying to think of something in my house to fix for breakfast for five children in the morning. And I said, well, here's $75. Go out and get something for them. Because there are those of us who love God, those of you who've had houses and land, silver and gold, you don't love him any better than we do. We love God. We've served God. We don't have a whole lot of, we don't have no more skeletons in our closet than you have in yours. And why God issues it out the way he does it, I don't understand it. But I've accepted Jesus Christ because he tells me that if I work the works of him that sent me, that he's going to come one day and reward everyone according to their works. And I've come to tell you, baby, hold in there, payday, someday. God for nothing. God's got something for you. I hope he give you a little bit before you die, but don't worry about it. Whatever God has observed that you've done for him, payday someday. And the thing I like about him, he has enough. He has enough. He ain't gonna run out. He's gonna reward us according to the riches of his grace and his glory. And he's got a whole lot. Y'all ain't got enough down here. Y'all got four or five houses I might live in. But when I get to heaven, there's going to be mansion after mansion and glory after glory and worlds without end and forever and ever and ever and ever. I serve him and I invite you to serve him. 
We can talk about the riches of Christians in the context of America and Europe, but when you get into the third world and to India and Africa, where evangelists don't even get $5 a month, you will see the necessity of heaven. Somebody say, well, I got mine right down here, and that's what Jesus is going to tell you. You had yours right down there. But he's going to turn to others, and he's going to say, come ye blessed of my Father. And I serve him because he's going to give me something. Amen. He's going to reward me. And it's going to be according to my works. And you lazy rascal, you better get on up and start doing something because nothing times nothing equals nothing. But wait a minute. That's not, that's not the fullness of my motivation. Paul gives me more here. In Philippians, that third chapter, the other reason I've accepted and I've followed him is that um, I met my father for the first time when I was 16. And I hated my father for, from 16, well, all of my life until I was 21. I had no role model as a father. I had no defense when the boys would jump on you. And so I accepted Jesus that I may know him and to become one with him and to know the power of his resurrection. I have to rush on. My final point is Romans gives it to us. I'm serving and following Jesus that I may reign with him. That I may enjoy glory that he has. For I'm an heir, a joint heir. Behold, right now. I want to give you an illustration I'm through. In 1982, I received a telephone call from a friend of mine, Jesse Jackson. We were very close. And I said, he said to me, he said, Ed, I want you to go to the Middle East with me. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going over to visit Jerusalem and Jordan. I said, on one trip? He said, yes. I said, no, I'm not going. Ain't going to get me killed. <laughs> stay here and go over there and get killed if you want to. I'm going to stay here and pray for you. He said, that's exactly why I'm asking you to go with me. I want you to pray for me. He said, now I have doc I mean, I have journalists and I have lawyers and I have council of churches and everybody else going, but I need a prayer partner. And I said, well, Jesse, we are prayer partners. A lot of people don't know Jesse prays, but he's quite a prayer partner. Whenever a Negro runs president of the United States, he prays. <laughs> Pray. And I said, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. And he said, well, pray about it. And in two days, I had two reasons. I made up my mind. I don't have time to tell you about it. But when we got, when we got to Jerusalem, the first encounter, over 100 cameras and newsmen surrounded the plane. And I got disconnected from Jesse. And they were pushing me back, back, back. And Jesse turned around and said, hey, He's with me. And they opened up and they let me come on in. And then when we got that night, the mayor of Jerusalem gave us a banquet. And I didn't have no tickets. And I was at the door trying to get in and the Jews didn't know me. But Jesse saw me at the door and he said, hey, he's with me. And the man said, oh, please, honored guests, come on in. <laughs> And Jesse stood up and said, you must give the Palestinians their right to a homeland. And everybody frowned in that building. And on, en route back to the hotel, they stoned our bus. And I was on the floor with Jesse. I said, man, you could have written that. 
and send it over here. You didn't have to come over here and say all that. <laughs> and the next day we went to the West Bank where the Palestinians were. And when the bus rolled up, 10,000 Palestinians surrounded it, talking about Jesse, Jesse. And they picked him up physically and they were packing him on upstairs and Jesse, flat of his back, said, that big one is with me. <laughs> And they grabbed me and took me on upstairs. And when we got in the assembly of the Palestinian mayors and these youngsters, 13 and 14 years old, with machine guns or automatic pistols all around the wall, and Jesse got up and said, you must let the Jew have a right to live at peace. And everybody cocked their guns. <laughs> and I stood up and said, I want to explain what Jesse's trying to tell y'all. <laughs> And then we went on to Jordan. And when we crossed Jordan, oh, bless his name. When we crossed Jordan, King Hussein had nine Mercedes-Benz limousines waiting on us to carry us to Amman, Jordan. And naturally, being with Jesse, I walked up to the biggest and the best one, and I attempted to get in, and the guard says, no! And I, I said, uh, Jesse, and he said, he's with me. <laughs> and the man said, please. When we got to Jordan, we went to the palace, and that palace was so elaborate until every chair had a waiter. Not every table, but a waiter per chair. And I went in and attempted to sit down up near the crown prince, and the man said, who are you? You're not to sit here. And Jesse said, he's with me. And the man said, please. <laughs> and then the crown prince said, you can buy nothing in Jordan. Whatever you need in Jordan is yours as a gift. And I went home and I thought about eating something because they just had a few little hors d'oeuvres. And I looked at the price. I said, well, I can't eat here. But then it occurred to me, I'm guest of the king. And I got me a filet mignon. And I sent out my clothes. And I got the telephone and talked for over an hour and a half to my wife. I'm guest of the king. And then Jesse and I parted. And I came on back and he went wherever he was. But then it began to occur to me that one glad morning, when this life is over, and when I get to the gates, and when justice will stand there and won't let me in, Jesus is going to say, he's with me. Let him in. Let him in. Sit down at the welcome table. It's yours. You are guests. You may have never, you may have never been welcomed to the famous house. You may have never been welcomed to the governor's house. You may have never had an invitation like Paul and like Pastor to come to the Oval Office. And that may never be your lot. You may never rise in this world no higher socially than you are now. But if you accept Jesus, one of these days, you, you, you little miss nobody on the television. That's where you think you are. Jesus is going to say, and he's going to point you out specifically. My mama who never, who never did anything but scrubbed. One of these days, Jesus is going to say, she's with me. I wasn't in Jordan but three days living like a king. But heaven will be forever.
with heads bowed and there's somebody here tonight you have not you have not done it you have not done it and there's somebody listening to me and particularly those friends of mine you fellows in prison that I hear from and you write me your lot here on earth may not change but right in prison you can become guest of the king and so if you have not prayed that prayer all over this building bow your head and the pastor has already told us magnify and maximize your sin tell the Lord you're a sinner and that you've sinned that's what sinners do and tell him save me Lord save me all over the building save me Lord save me now and then those of you who have experienced the salvation but you have wandered away from home say forgive me Lord and right tonight I feel led of the spirit on television and here who will just stand and say save me Lord save me Lord I see you standing who will just stand and say I need to pray that prayer save me Lord Jesus yes 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 Come on here, come on, come on here, come here. Come home tonight. Come home, come on. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Workers and counselors will need you because I believe God is going to call you from the balcony and wherever you are, just without shame, without shame. Come down here and say, Preacher, I'm in need of salvation. If I die tonight, I'd go to hell. I want to be saved. And then somebody get on up and say, Preacher, I am saved, but I have backslided. I'm cold. I'm indifferent. I'm not faithful nowhere where I'm working. Come on here now. Come on here now, wherever you are. As the pianist and others come to sing that, come home. Come home. Where's another? Where's another? Come on. Yes, 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 yes. If somebody asks you later, why did you go down there, just say, get thee behind me, Satan. Just come on home, come on home, come on home tonight, earnestly. Come on, come on, you who are on television, wherever you are, there is a number on the screen. Get right down before that television and say, save me, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Wash me, Lord. Give me another opportunity. And come on home and call that number and write a letter. Let us help you. Why not multitude stand and say, I'm coming home. I'm rededicating myself. I'm giving myself to Jesus. We're going to pray for you in just a moment. Come and get in the prayer line now. Thank you, Pastor Hill. The scripture says that if thou shalt believe in thine heart, Confess with thy mouth, Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus also said, if you will confess me before men, I will can confess you before my Father and all the holy angels. I'm proud of you for coming down tonight and publicly confessing your new faith in Jesus Christ. If there's even one other soul, please come, even as I lead you in a little prayer, and settle it now and forever that Jesus Christ is your Savior. After the two great words we've heard tonight about the grace of God and then the warning that's been given by Pastor Hill, there should not be one soul under the sound of our voice that would leave not knowing or confessing Christ as Savior. Will you follow me in a little prayer right now? Just say this prayer at home or in this room. Let's pray it all together and it will help these who perhaps are praying it for the first time. Just say this prayer with me out loud. Oh God, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I do believe 
Jesus died for me. I believe he shed his precious blood to forgive all my sin. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Savior now and forever. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that little prayer and meant it, oh, I see tears of joy flowing right now. People are knowing Christ as Savior. Church, this is the best news that could be proclaimed across the land. People are coming to Christ tonight. Will you welcome another whole group into the family of God? You at home, call that number on your screen. Please call that number. There's a prayer partner there to talk to you, love you, and pray with you in Jesus' name. Would you do the next thing? Just turn to your neighbor right now and just tell him I'm saved. That confession of the mouth is so important. I'm saved. I'm saved. Tomorrow night, another great night here at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. Pastor Hill warned us about hell, told us about heaven. Hal Lindsay will be here tomorrow night to tell us when it's all going to happen. It'll be a wonderful night, and I hope you'll come back and be with us for another great night of blessing here with live Praise the Lord. Dean and Mary, I think we can sing a part of it as we say goodnight in song, a great song of praise. Tell them to drop the last spot. Give me one more minute, and let's sing this tremendous hymn of the church with Dean and Mary Brown as we say goodnight. Holy, holy, holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. the Lord. If you'd like an audio cassette of today's program, please write National Program Number 0125-90. That's 0125-90. The tapes will be sent to you for your love gift to the Praise the Lord program. TBN has a worldwide ministry, and we need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going all around the world. So write today to Praise the Lord, Pico Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write to TBN, Pico Box 24215, APO, Richmond, B.C., B7B, 1Y2. If you would like to contact guests or musicians for the tapes, books, or albums, please write to us at TBN, and we'll be more than glad to forward your correspondence. And if you haven't asked Christ into your life, call our prayer partners right now and pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, until next time, remember to keep on praising the Lord. This program was brought to you by the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.